Okay. So now that folks are entering the space, I'm going to go ahead and get us uh, started. Um, allow me to welcome you. Uh, my name is Winston C. Thompson. I'm an associate professor of educational studies, as well as, by courtesy, an associate professor of philosophy <clears throat> and member of the steering committee uh, for the Center for Ethics and Human Values here at Ohio State. Now, this community conversation uh, is part of an ongoing series, which itself is part of Ohio State's new Shared Values Initiative. Uh, and that Shared Values Initiative aims to reinforce our university's ethical culture and uh, uh, help us to live our shared values towards better advancing the university's core work of teaching, learning, research, and service. The goal of these conversations, of course, is to encourage reflection and discussion on the interconnected web of values that shapes life and work at our university. Each conversation focuses on a different set of values, which include excellence and impact, inclusion and equity, care and compassion, and integrity and respect. But today, our conversation is going to focus on the values of diversity and innovation as they might forward Ohio State's vision and its mission. So today in our uh, session on diversity and innovation, the shared values for the civic work of connecting people and ideas, uh, I wanna note that uh, this conversation is not gonna be complete without your input. So we wish to hear from you and ask that you please submit your questions in the Q&A box, which you'll find uh, there in your Zoom window. Towards the end of our time today with our guest, uh, we'll shift our conversational focus away from uh, the interaction between the two of us and uh, towards your good questions or your uh, uh, requests for follow up on ideas that have been discussed, or perhaps even new topics on our theme that you think are worthy of our attention. So as always, we look forward to conversing with you and we ask that you uh, start putting those questions into the Q&A box at any point during our discussion. So uh, don't wait until the end uh, as you're you know, forming your questions because uh, the queue might be uh, such that uh, your question might get lost in the shuffle. So if you've got a question, uh, do uh, submit it um, uh, when you have it uh, so that your voice can be a part of this conversation. And speaking of this conversation, uh, our guest today is Mira Levinson. Uh, the Juliana W. and William Foss Thompson Professor of Education and Society at Harvard Graduate School of Education, uh, Harvard University. Professor Levinson is a normative political philosopher who works at the intersection of civic education, uh, youth empowerment, racial justice, and educational ethics. She's currently working on establishing a global field of educational ethics, ensuring that this newly demarcated field is philosophically rigorous, disciplinarily and experientially inclusive, uh, and both relevant to and informed by educational policy and practice. Levinson's work in this area has been supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, and the Spencer Foundation. Recently, Levinson's been busy publishing white papers and articles on the ethical dimensions of COVID-19 and that pandemic's impact on education. But I should also note that she is the co-editor of a pair of really terrifically generative books on the intersection of ethics and education. This includes uh, Dilemmas of Educational Ethics, Cases and Commentaries, uh, as well as uh, democratic discord in schools, again, cases and commentaries in educational ethics. Additionally, she is also the author of The Demands of Liberal Education, as well as uh, a quite uh, a striking and powerful book, No Citizen Left Behind. So I ask that you please join me in extending a very warm Buckeye welcome to Professor Levinson. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks so much for having me, Winston. <laughs> Terrific. So I'm excited to uh, engage with your uh, thinking on uh, the theme that we have today for our conversation. And so uh, I just want to uh, really launch right into things. I've got uh, uh, some, some thoughts here, but, um, you know, to my mind, across your, your work, you've been a real sort of uh, steady advocate. Uh, for action guiding uh, 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 the ethical theorizing within and about educational contexts. So 
I'm wondering if you could help us understand why it might be important for us to develop approaches to thinking about values and, uh, and thinking about ethics uh, in ways that really uh, do guide our actions under the real world circumstances that we're likely to experience, uh, you know, particularly here uh, in our work on our campuses. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Um, so, you know, I think in some ways it might seem a little weird to specify that we want action guiding ethics. Um, it's like, well, isn't that what ethics is about? Like, isn't isn't ethics about what we should do and like, you know, what we are we should feel obliged to do or feel that it's okay to do or what we should feel forbidden from doing. Um, and the I think the reason though, uh, and, and the answer is yes, that is what ethics is about. But uh, as you well know, um, a lot of the work, particularly that philosophers do in ethics, uh, is attempting to really understand concepts and ethical demands really clearly and carefully in a sort of crystalline um, fashion. And so the best way to do that is uh, the philosopher that many philosophers at least think is to abstract them away from all of the like the, the dirtiness and the messiness and the um, confusion of real life uh, and to think about it on a really abstract and idealized level. Just the way you say that if a scientist is trying to understand, um, you know, forces or friction or whatever, like that they they abstract into, you know, say, uh, a world where gravity doesn't exist or whatever, right? Like, because sure. you really want to understand those things. Um, you don't want all the other messiness, you know, you don't want to, like, do your experiments in a soot-filled industrial city <laughs> if, like, what you're trying to do is understand ideal gas laws or something. Uh, and similarly, you know, we shouldn't ask ourselves what, well, what are our moral responsibilities with regard to a certain, you know, thing if it's also like messed up with all of the realities and mundanities of life. But the problem is when we do ethics that way, then in fact, it gives us remarkably little guidance for what we should do now here in mm. this messiness, right? And so that's the reason that I actually think that doing action guiding ethics um, is pretty different from just doing ethics. Because when we think about, well, what are the actions that we should take today, tomorrow, uh, you know, today's election day and, uh, you know, many communities across the United States, right? Whom should I vote for? Should I say yes or no on these ballot initiatives or these propositions or whatever, right? All of that has to take into account the messiness of real life. Um, because if it doesn't, then we just go profoundly, like we're just wrong about how we're trying to um, act, right? If we sure. say, well, I understand that there is, you know, systemic racism and injustice, or I understand that the river is polluted right now, or I understand that, you know, people don't have access uh, to high quality health care, but I am going to vote right now or or you know make a decision right now or act right now as if they do well that would just be morally irresponsible right and so what mm -hmm. we need is an ethics that helps us take into account the features of the world that we live in now to help us guide our actions now yeah you know uh, that makes so much sense to, to my ears you know unsurprisingly uh, uh, you'll, you'll, you'll find that I'm sympathetic to, uh, to what you've said you know it's the case that I often you know when I describe myself uh, you know as a, a an ethicist or a philosopher or what have you you know to, to, to persons that I meet at the you know at the park the grocery store uh, the response is oh wow that's you know uh, that's work that I couldn't do or that's uh, you know uh, seemingly you know requires uh, uh, capacities that I don't, I don't possess they might uh, sort of express something like that and I'm always struck by you know the degree to which at least from my perspective and it sounds like from yours as well you know these persons are immersed in a world that is rich with ethical uh, nuance and meaning and and and, and weight and so um, the fact that they think of ethics uh, as something that is is, you know, uh, for someone else, or it is somehow uh, uh, unavailable to them. Uh, the, the 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 gate is closed, as it were. Uh, seems like a real uh, a real loss uh, to the broader field of ethics, particularly as we're attempting collectively uh, to address some of the issues that I hear you to be describing. Issues that affect all of us. 
Yeah, I mean, it's a loss in both directions, right? Because yeah. in fact, everybody you talk to at the grocery store is making ethical decisions, yeah. right? They all are every day in a variety of ways, and they are called upon to make ethical decisions. Um, and so if in fact, it doesn't occur to them, say, to turn to your work or to others, um, you know, for any guidance where, you know, you are actually writing about uh, or developing podcasts about or speaking about, right, uh, the very issues that concern them, then that's a loss to them. It is also a loss to us that as we are puzzling about, you know, how should we understand the ethical dimensions of um, a particular decision or phenomenon or system or institution that so often uh, we as philosophers are uninformed by the experiences and insights um, of the people who are actually living uh, those decisions, yeah. living yeah. within and working and being affected by those institutions or those phenomena or those systems. And, and that's, I think, an equal tragedy. Yeah, I think that, that 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 feels exactly right to me. I mean, as you notice uh, and you note the sort of uh, uh, reciprocity of this relationship, right? It moves in both directions, and there's a loss to both sides. You know, um, in your response there, you you made reference to you know the resources uh, that are produced by you know persons like uh, yourself or, or or people like me, uh, uh, our colleagues at our institutions, and I'm I'm struck by the way in which uh, you know the work that occurs uh, in a university setting uh, can uh, inform so much of what happens in the world around us, right? It's not the case that, um, you know, the work that's happening uh, uh, within the walls of our uh, campuses is, you know, sort of, uh, or said differently, I'm not writing only for you and you're not writing only for me. We're hoping to engage a, a, a broader world. And so, you know, I'm, I'm thinking now about the ways in which uh, we sometimes, as universities, as institutions, we sometimes uh, might fall short of influencing that broader world and uh, moving uh, 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 the rest of our um, uh, colleagues and uh, uh, um, folks towards greater justice. I mean, institutions of higher education, colleges and universities are often envisioned as uh, vehicles for moving us towards a more just society. But you know, our campuses can fall short of these goals uh, for both the broader society, and they can also fall short of these goals uh, in more local uh, ways within our community. To your mind, what are some of the ways that we might begin to, if you will, rethink how we respond to uh, some of our shortcomings, right? Some of the inequalities that exist on uh, our campuses and perhaps the ways in which some of our practices perpetuate uh, some of the inequalities that we might uh, in our best moments uh, commit ourselves to trying to uh, to resolve or to respond to. Um, if it's okay with you, I think I'll, I'll try to answer your question a bit more in the positive of like, what do I sure. see happening on different campuses that I think uh, does embody the kind of responsibility and relationships we'd like Good. to have uh, as members of higher education institutions. So, you know, I think of um, universities, right? So we, we have a few uh, really major and distinctive activities. Uh, mm -hmm. One is that we teach a lot, right? Uh, and a second is that we do research. Um, and a third, uh, particularly for land grant universities, and for community colleges um, and for regional colleges and, and universities is that we are uh, sort of members of the sort of local community and we, we're, we're responsible for serving the local community in terms of uh, producing workers, producing uh, engaged citizens, leaders, et cetera. Um, and so I think in each of those domains, there are ways in which universities can and do, although as you note, don't always, or even don't instinctively 
uh, embody the kinds of more uh, egalitarian and inclusive um, and ethical relationships that you know we would like them to have. So, uh, in the area of teaching, uh, you had talked about sort of inequities on campus and um, some forms of exclusion. Like, I do think it's incredibly important that we diversify uh, the range of students um, who come onto campus and feel welcomed on the campus and who are actually supported in learning on campus, right? Uh, it is still the case that uh, particularly selective and highly selective and elite universities serve a far more disproportionately wealthy student body uh, than uh, exists, uh, right? And then uh, potentially has talent. And, uh, and the, I think that it's what's striking to me, I actually recently finished writing a paper about this, um, is that oftentimes universities say, well, we try really hard, but you know, uh, we, we don't know how to support, like students who, we can't mm -hmm. accept students who really have underdeveloped skills, right? And you know, like that, that's a failure of the K-12 system, that's a failure of the broader society, but like, what are we supposed to do? And I, I've been thinking about the ways in which actually universities are incredibly good at supporting uh, students whom they do value, who often meet only the barest minimum of the academic requirements uh, at the university. And frankly, uh, to some extent, those are uh, students from very wealthy families where the universities are trying to get philanthropic money. And another large group is actually athletes. Uh, and I'm not meaning to demean athletes, right? I, you know, universities consistently claim, and I have every reason to believe, that they meet the minimum threshold for acceptance, right? Uh, but, you know, but it's not like necessarily, they're not being accepted because, you know, because they're academic superstars. And what happens is that universities that have serious athletic programs put an immense number of resources into helping, or at least the good ones, the ethical ones, right? They put an immense number of resources into helping the athletes succeed as students, as scholar athletes. And so that means that they get individualized tutoring often. They get academic uh, advisors who really pay attention to what classes they're signing up for who correspond with the professors to see how are the students doing. They have set aside uh, study hours and places in the library and people they can go to for help. They have special meals often <laughs> that they get. They have housing over the breaks. Uh, they have uh, sort of on-demand mental and physical uh, health services. Like we could actually be doing that for many additional students who also might struggle to succeed academically, you know, if we've admitted them because they, we don't think that they're necessarily as well prepared as the average student. And by, in that way, actually broadly diversify the range mm -hmm. of uh, students who we accept on our campuses. We've simply chosen not to do that. <laughs> um, so it's not that we don't know how to support a really broader array of students. It's that we've chosen to, Put, put a lot of resources into one category of students who we think may need academic support and social support and emotional support and so forth without uh, putting our resources into a broader array. Also, frankly, in teaching, in the, you know, once, once we have people on campus, we should do a better job of, um, of teaching students a broader array of courses, but also, so uh, as you know, Harry Brickhouse and I were uh, at the North American Association for Philosophy and Education uh, this past weekend, and we gave sort of dueling keynotes about the ethics of um, higher education admissions and then serving students while they're on campus. And his paper uh, was about the importance of really high quality pedagogy, right? And we mm. reckon, and I think he's exactly right about this. We recognize that good teaching matters in elementary and high schools, right? Like, and that if a student doesn't learn, say algebra in eighth grade, uh, then we actually have sort of gone over to, or in ninth grade, we've gone over to faulting the teacher and the system 
as much as or more than we fault the student. We say, okay, you know, it's our obligation to arrange and to sort of create instructional and learning opportunities for you to make sure that you can succeed in this because we believe that in fact, all children can learn Algebra 1 when given the proper supports, which I think is true. Similarly, on college campuses, we should feel that same sense of obligation, all right? If you are taking, say, Bio 101, and it is a necessary course for you to major in a STEM field, for you to be in the pre-med track or whatever, it's not on you to keep up with it. And like, and we say, oh, well, we guess you're not good at bio if you, you know, end up failing, right, or doing really badly. It's up to us as an institution to give you the very best pedagogical experience, instructional experience that we can, and to offer you the support so that, you know, if this is something you care about, you actually can succeed with that. So that was all about teaching. There's more to say, but I'm going to stop there. On the research front, um, I also think that we could be doing, and you do this, I do this, a bunch of you know, people do this, right? Do research in collaboration with others who we hope will use our research beyond the academy, right? There are times that we uh, write for our fellow scholars and it's really important to do so, right? And there's no, you know, uh, that that's a really important form of scholarship, but I do believe it's not the only kind of scholarship that we do, that we should be doing. And even when we do write for fellow scholars, there may be good reasons in if we're interested in doing action guiding scholarship, right, to seek out yeah. evidence from, insights from, responses from, use cases from those who are outside of the scholarly world. And then I think also it's a really important responsibility in our research to uh, find ways, even if what we write, if, if one of our products is say an article that is in an academic journal that's behind a paywall that uses various kinds of technical language that make it very unlikely that a non-scholarly audience will read it. Also to think, well, if this is scholarship that should matter to a non-scholarly audience, so how do I also put it, uh, sort of reframe it uh, and put it in a place, in a language, in a form uh, that, the non-scholars can access it. And that might be as you do through a podcast. Um, mm -hmm. I have a colleague, Noni Lusso, who has a principle that for every academic uh, article she or her doctoral students write in their lab, they also write a practice-oriented piece. She's a, a oh, sort wow. of literacy scholar that they, and, and it's just a one-to-one -one ratio, right? They, they wow. will not publish uh, an article without also publishing something um, that is accessible to reading teachers, English teachers, whatever. As you know, I try to create normative case studies that we post on my website that are designed uh, for people to use in the classroom and professional development settings, et cetera. There are lots of different ways that we can do this, um, but we should do some of it. And then because I've gone on for a really, really long time, I'll leave aside the sort of whole relationship with the community piece because that I think could take us forever too. <laughs> Well, and, and, I, and I, I do want to talk about that uh, uh, with you as well, uh, but I just want to take a moment to kind of um, uh, just identify some of what I, what I, what I heard you to be saying and, and sort of connect it to some of uh, what I suspect we might uh, still discuss. I mean, on the one hand, it seemed that you uh, were uh, sort of describing how, you know, universities, institutions of higher education uh, recognize uh, that, you know, uh, using their resources uh, towards uh, supporting um, uh, uh, some students, right? Um, uh, the ways in which we might uh, then sort of expand, uh, uh, you know, our recognition of the value of, um, you know, other student groups, uh, such that we use resources towards supporting those other student groups as well. And I heard you to be suggesting something about, um, you know, uh, the ways in which we might come to value having a very broad and diverse array of students on our uh, university campuses, um, uh, which I could imagine by extension, we might also begin then thinking about broadening uh, um, uh, participation and having a very diverse uh, faculty, right? Having diverse um, uh, uh, staff, right? Uh, uh, thinking about leadership uh, uh, and diversity in, uh, in those ranks as well. And I, I could imagine then uh, sort of an image 
of our sort of our work, uh, thinking about who we are as a university uh, and asking ourselves, what is it that we want to accomplish, right? I mean, uh, what is it that we want to achieve um, uh, and coming to recognize that we might have uh, in some ways the capacity uh, to realize some of our sort of abiding uh, uh, values that are articulated in many of our core documents. I'm reminded of, uh, uh, Ohio State's um, uh, 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 vision uh, and the ways in which the vision sort of uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, filters into the mission. Uh, the mission filters into the very values uh, that guide us. Those values informing uh, principles that uh, might guide our behavior. You know, and uh, it's the case that today. Uh, we're talking uh, about a particular uh, subset of these values. We're talking about diversity and innovation. Um, and diversity and innovation is about sort of, you know, welcoming difference and making connections uh, among people and ideas, which we've begun talking about. But given your expertise in thinking about how educational efforts might align with civic aims in particular, right, civic aims, how might we understand, to your mind, how might we understand the value of diversity and innovation as it connects to our uh, institutions, uh, uh, our institutional missions, critical commitment to fostering a culture of engagement and service, right? As we think about engagement and service and these civic aims, how might we think about the value of diversity and innovation here? Uh, all right, so this is super complicated. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so in good ways, I mean, so one of the things is that you started with pointing out that I had been talking about diversifying the student body, but not also talking about the necessary and essential diversification um, of the sort of adults on campus, right? Like the, the <laughs> staff and faculty uh, and administration. And you're absolutely right about that. Um, uh, in part because we won't be able to serve a diversified student body well if we do not have a diversified um, faculty and staff and leadership, but also uh, because, you know, thinking about uh, the, the research aims and the community serving aims, and this gets us then to the question about the civic uh, dimensions that you're asking, we'll, we will have a narrow and cramped conception, right, mm -hmm. of what, uh, what that means um, and what kinds of avenues of action are open to us and what kinds of needs exist out there and what our role is um, as an institution of higher education in serving that, which is usually not uh, what I think universities all too often do, which is say, oh, well, we have knowledge, right? We're experts. We're here, you know, you called us, we're here to tell you what to do, right? Sure. And, you know, that's actually not necessarily um, the what other people are asking of us, or really what the uh, our best mode of uh, engagement is, right? Um, so I think uh, oftentimes, you know, so sometimes it is listening, and, and this actually gets us, you know, both to land grant universities and community colleges and others, right? Um, what is it that uh, other people, that employers, that uh, government leaders, that cultural innovators, et cetera, mm. are asking for us to help provide to the community, right? Like, and how can we then, um, you know, grow our offerings, uh, you know, um, change our, uh, our majors or add a school or whatever, you know, that might, um, mm. that might serve those needs that are really felt in the community. But also, I think uh, a second uh, real aim is um, it is listening and working that that being in service neither means saying oh look we can run in you know as experts and tell you stuff nor does it mean merely sort of following what other people tell us and saying, oh, okay, you know, you're telling me to hammer the nail here. I can do that, right? Which is sure. basically <laughs> the, uh, the most that I could ever do in helping say to build a habitat for humanity house. Like I'm certainly sure. not going to exercise any innovation whatsoever. But I think, you know, the, the uh, some of the most generative uh, work is mm -hmm. when we are in true uh, dialogue with mutual learning from and mutual knowledge and action creation with 
those whom we are trying to serve, uh, right? Where then um, people outside the university can actually come to understand us better than they often do, right? Mm -hmm. We're not only a place for frat parties. We're not only a place that prepares uh, workers for the new economy. We're not only a place uh, that thinks that we're better than you know people two uh, blocks away or whatever, that we're actually a really, really complex institution um, mm -hmm. that's attempting to do many things, trying to do it well, right? Like we're really trying to be be ethical about what we do, um, but uh, and that there are many ways in which we try to do that, uh, and that we're, where we can collaborate and learn and create something better together, right, than we could yeah. ever do apart. And that is the reason also really to seek out diversity within the walls of the campus at all the levels, you know, you're talking about the, the, the staff, the student, the faculty, uh, the administrative leadership, because that's actually how we get innovation, right? As opposed to simply continuing to do things that the people who are in the, on the inside already know how to do pretty well. You know, I, I'm, I'm struck by the ways in which your response uh, kind of, you know, uh, uh, um, points towards a, a, a real, I mean, it, it almost feels, um, it feels like I'm underserving the concept to just say that it's, it's being responsive. But, but I, I mean this in a very sort of full-bodied way, that there's a type of uh, responsiveness that you're describing here that is, you know, it, 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 it's a, that, that, that has a high standard to it that requires, um, you know, it's not, it's not simply, it's not mere listening. It's not uh, following directions uh, from outside of the walls of the university. It's not giving directions, right? But it's, it's this kind of, you, you use the term dialogical. It's sort of a, this sort of a true dialogical relationship that is, you know, um, responsive uh, is the word that I'm using, responsive in ways that are going to be generative. So as you were talking about uh, true innovation, right? Uh, we might begin to imagine that there are, you know, you know, possibilities for firstly identifying problems uh, that we didn't realize existed, right? On either side, inside or outside of the university, right? Mm -hmm. But it's in the collaboration, in the responsiveness, uh, in the cooperation that we come to recognize some of these uh, problems that might need to, uh, uh, to be addressed. And uh, in addition to recognizing problems, I could imagine that there's also then um, the potential for new solution to new solutions to problems that we'd already uh, identified or these new problems, right? That we can begin imagining different ways of, uh, of, of responding um, and different ways of sort of prioritizing the resources, leveraging the resources of the university towards, uh, as you've uh, been describing, uh, ethically engaged action in the service of some public good. Uh, could you say a little bit more about how we might come to recognize or understand what that, you know, public good or what that, that aim uh, 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 might be uh, that we could be uh, in pursuit of? Yeah, um, so let me so let me give you an example, actually, in this yeah. case from my own work. So it's going to be more narrow than you just asked about, but yeah. I think the concreteness might help. So when the, uh, so as you know, and as you said in my bio, I, I'm doing work in educational ethics uh, and trying to think about how we can help uh, develop ethical theory and other resources to help policymakers and practitioners, teachers, guidance counselors, uh, school principals, school board members, et cetera, you know, on the ground, uh, basically do more ethical stuff, right? Like, you know, do what they want to do, even, you know, and fulfill their ethical responsibilities. Um, and so, when schools shut down last spring at the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, one of the things that uh, we, like I just started seeing in the newspapers on, you know, in podcasts on TV or YouTube or whatever, was a lot of educators really wrestling with uh, the ethical dimensions of their work, right? Like, you know, how do I reach out to kids uh, and whom should I be reaching out to and how far, how intrusive should I get into their, you know, bedrooms through Zoom and, sure. you know, 
like what is it right for me to expect of kids while all of you know while the world seems to be just like shutting down should I be asking kids to do, do homework if I don't ask them to do homework am I like getting rid of all any shred of normalcy that might exist if I do ask them am I just like am, you know making them ever more stressed out when they you know mm. all of this stuff is really hard right we feel really like teachers feel really strong sense of moral responsibility toward their students, toward their colleagues, towards their schools, et cetera. And we were kind of unmoored. And so uh, we created discussion groups. Uh, we sort of issued actually a global invitation to teachers. If you want to come talk about the ethical challenges that you're facing right now while teaching under COVID, while you know schools are shut down, come join these discussion groups. And so we ended up uh, last sort of late spring and summer and kind of May through July running just 11 of these uh, around the world with, with educators from I think about 12 or 14 different countries. Um, mm -hmm. And part of, so they were, um, in part, it was simply an act of service of our saying, you know, instead of like wrestling with this at home and beating yourself up, but like, if you wanna just talk to people, it was kind of a therapeutic intervention, right? But there was also actually, and that actually was a service, like it, fascinatingly Definitely. at the end of these the discussions, it, so many people say, I felt so much better. Like I, you know, it's just so good to talk with others in the same position, but also in the middle of these conversations, as we heard things, as philosophers, actually, we would sometimes stop and say, okay, you know, what we hear you saying is actually like a bunch of you are talking about how you're really wrestling with like, you know, uh, questions about uh, how your obligations to your, the individual versus your obligations to the collective, or you're really wrestling with different meanings of uh, care here. Like we hear, you know, and and you're identifying self-care, you're identifying care towards students, you're, you know, and and using some of the, uh, you know, slightly more technical concepts, right? Like, because mm -hmm. we were philosophers, we had uh, certain kinds of concepts and certain kinds of abstract, uh, abstractions available to us and sort of sure. naming things and reformulating things for the educators in the conversations, they also found really helpful. Now, at the end of those conversations, we then took, we, we got their permission, you know, they signed consent forms, we actually recorded these conversations and we analyzed them. And in one case, we actually have this uh, article that I've mostly been sitting on that I need to do the final round of edits on for us to send off to an academic journal about like, what were, what was the constellation of ethical, uh, you know, concerns that teachers were wrestling with um, at in the first spring of the pandemic, but also yeah. Uh, and so that was increasing, sort of, they were increasing our scholarly knowledge. Also, though, by our hearing these shared ethical concerns of teachers, we are producing normative case studies and other resources to actually help the educators now have conversations with one another and with their principals and with their parents and, you know, with community members about these ethical dilemmas. Um, because, you know, for better or worse, for worse, really, they're ongoing ethical dilemmas, right? And so we are trying to then give back tools that will help them do the work that they want to do and help them be better educators and help create sort of more grounded schools and communities. And so, yeah, that is the kind of sort of dialogic responsiveness. Uh, and I think uh, sort of service where it's, where it's an interweaving of the of the scholarly and the lived in order to try to you know create an action guiding ethics uh, right where it's it's never that it, it is true that when we wrote our article we sort of went off when we did our scholarly little coding and had our philosophical sure. discussions and so forth but then we also very quickly are trying to turn around and feed things back into. Uh, practitioners lives so that they can use them because that is also feels equally important to me. Yeah, I mean, so so in your description here, um, and let me just remind uh, attendees that you can uh, con you can continue to submit questions in the Q and A box uh, down below, and uh, I do want to make sure that we have 
uh, time to engage some of the good questions that I'm seeing coming through. Uh, so do submit your questions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Professor Levinson, as you're describing, uh, uh, you know, this process, I'm struck by the ways in which it might sometimes feel to us, um, or at least I'll, I'll just own it and say, it sometimes feels to me um, that, you know, what you've just described is, you know, it's, it's, it's um, clear in a moment of crisis, right? Uh, when we have a problem that we've sort of all identified and that uh, we kind of uh, all recognize or uh, there's an urgency of sort of solving a particular uh, uh, matter because uh, it has suddenly confronted us. And um, in those moments, uh, it can be, um, you know, uh, it, it can seem to us uh, as, you know, members of uh, the university it can seem to us very appropriate, right? To have some of these connections that you're describing. And I'm, I'm thinking about ways in which you know, given your earlier comment, uh, comments, uh, plural, ways in which we might, you know, really center uh, the work of the university so that these great moments of the sort that you've just described and that you do often, uh, that these sorts of uh, moments of connection and uh, uh, collaborative uh, 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 and responsive dialogical uh, um, uh, uh, work, uh, you know, are more common and are uh, in many ways uh, um, uh, actualized as uh, uh, the very essence of uh, a lot of what we're up to here at, at the university. Yeah, um, given that I'm, I'm, I'm struck by uh, you know, sort of uh, the uh, Ohio State's uh, uh, mission. Um, and in some ways, you know, the mission uh, of our uh, institution here um, uh, really sort of guides uh, our thinking about, um, you know, again, the very essence of what it is that we're up to. And there's just a lot of, you know, really rich content in uh, OSU's mission that um, I'll, I'll continue to think about uh, with uh, you and with other guests over the time uh, of, this, uh, of this series. But, you know, the mission is uh, uh, quite clear in identifying here, right, um, the importance of preparing a diverse student body to be leaders and engaged citizens. I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts about what, uh, you know, what it means to uh, prepare a diverse student body to be leaders and engaged citizens, and perhaps also something of the value of having, right, a diverse, and you've talked a little bit about this, but having a diverse student body uh, prepared for this work of leadership and engaged citizenship. Yeah. Um, so I think I think it's important. Um, I think the phrasing of this uh, sort of bullet of the mission statement is important because yeah. um, the because it is important to prepare diverse people, right? Um, but also the way to prepare them well is in part through its being a diverse student body. Right. Mm. So this goes back in part to what we were talking about before that um, I think in order to be good leaders and in order to be engaged citizens in the right ways, we should have, you know, as our instinct and our, as our practice uh, to seek out and learn from and work with diverse others. Right, that uh, this gets back to the diversity and innovation piece, right? Is yeah. that um, we will be more civically innovative, we will be more democratically responsive, we will be better leaders if we are um, committed to and in actuality do like working with, learning from. Uh, collaborating with diverse other people. So it's important that it is not just preparing diverse students, but preparing a diverse student body, which suggests that the body is already diverse, right? And, yeah. and then the leadership and the engaged citizenship is also does have to integrate, you know, the attentiveness to diversity in it. And there are many, many diverse ways to be good leaders and engaged citizens, right? So that's the other part mm. of it, right? Is that uh, the leadership, you know, there may be intellectual leadership, there may be economic leadership, political leadership, cultural leadership, uh, spiritual uh, leadership, right? Like there's all sorts of forms of, of leadership that it can take. And one can be, I think, uh, importantly, 
uh, a leader at many, many, many different levels. So like I act, I often have um, in um, here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, student or master students will come in and say, well, you know, I, I've been a teacher for the last four years, but I really want to have a bigger impact and I'm trying to decide, you know, therefore, should I go be a policymaker or a principal or something? And uh, but like, on the other hand, I've been learning in my classes that like policy doesn't like you can make all the policy you want. And then what really matters is what the people on the ground do. And I certainly know that because I ignored that new curriculum that came my way because <laughs> I didn't think it was going to work with my students. And, and my point is always to students that we um, that in fact, we can exercise leadership and have a big impact no matter where we are positioned is just a different kind, right? So like in ways I had a much more intense impact on the say 120 students I taught every year as an eighth grade teacher than I mm. do, you know, than I do on eighth grade students now, obviously, but I have, an, you know, this sort of diffuse impact on middle schoolers and on, you know, students in general through the work I do as a professor, which is different from the work that people do as uh, principals or as media literacy specialists or as um staffers in, you know, a city councilor's office, like we're all exercising, like we're yeah. all ideally engaged citizens, we're all exercising leadership and we have to have people in all of these different places, right? Like kids need a teacher in front of the classroom when they walk in and they need a superintendent who's thinking about the big directions for the districts and they need actually employers who employ them when they graduate. Like they, we need this whole ecosystem. And so I think that's, it's important. It's good that we have leaders and engaged citizens that is not sort of more specific than that because we do like um, the diverse student body also should find their ways into a really diverse array of um, of positions of, of spaces. Yeah. And we can, no matter where we are, we can all exercise leadership and demonstrate engagement. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struck by uh, the ways in which, you know, your response there, um, you know, brings us into a very tight focus on the mission, but also allows us to see how that mission uh, expands in some really uh, again, generative, uh, uh, generative ways. Uh, you know, as as um, uh, I sort of think about now transitioning our conversation towards some of the good questions that are here in the Q and A uh, box, and I know that a couple more are still coming. Um, I'm curious about your uh, sort of you know thoughts about um, uh, continued innovation, curiosity, and collaboration. You've talked about um, you know uh, uh, potential for collaboration, and uh, you've talked about how diversity might. Uh, uh, lead us to some really uh, innovative, um, you know, one of the questions uh, that sort of is before us is about the difference between uh, diversity and innovation and how, um, you know, here we're talking about diversity as sort of feeding into innovation and innovation as perhaps um, uh, pressing us towards uh, recognition of the value of diversity. But I'm curious about the ways in which, you know, a, a university, a public university like OSU with uh, urban, uh, some, you know, campuses that are urban and, uh, you know, with this sort of community engaged vision, you know, how might uh, an institution uh, of this sort continue to innovate in the pursuit of those new ideas and new solutions uh, to some of our most enduring questions, right? Thinking here about our civic, uh, civic aims. How should we be directing our curiosity? How should we structure some of the collaborations uh, that you've been describing uh, in our conversation thus far? Um, so I think in some ways, uh, I am a believer in a throw it at the wall and see what sticks strategy. <laughs> um, sure. it, uh, it, the Gates Foundation for uh, at least a number of years, I don't know if this is still their strategy or not, but they would often, I mean, this helps when you have billions and billions of dollars, but they would often fund um uh, various uh, innovations that were actually that that were in opposition to one another that had mm -hmm. theories of change that um, were you know I, if one was true the other one had to be false right <laughs> sure. um, uh, because they didn't you know they they recognized they were in that respect kind of epistemically humble right they recognized they didn't know 
Uh, mm -hmm. And they wanted, and that was a, you know, sort of throw it at the wall and, and see what sticks. And certainly that's, you know, the, uh, at least the, the verbal, the express ethos of places like Silicon Valley and so forth, right? You know, uh, uh, the, the fail fast and fail farther of like, just try things out, right? And yeah. so in that respect, um, I, I hope that the university uh, doesn't take only one approach, right, to encouraging innovation and curiosity and collaboration, but really uh, takes a whole variety of approaches to uh, inviting faculty and staff and students and community members to innovating in these various ways. So, you know, I think you can absolutely make uh, funds available to uh, faculty, to staff, to students who want to propose various kinds of uh, collaborative and innovative mm -hmm. work, right? Whether that's a new course, whether that's a joint research project, you know, with community members, whether that's taking an existing course and putting it someplace new, like in a local senior center, in, sure. you know, a prison, right? You know, uh, bringing in a, um, more diverse student body, uh, changing what the kinds of uh, research products are, right? So there's that kind of, so I think, you know, in fact, through creative seed funding, that gets a lot of people innovating mm. in various ways. Also, you know, frankly, from a faculty member's perspective, um, if we want to attract and retain a diverse, high quality faculty, then uh, it does mean innovating about what our criteria are for how we identify a high, what we mean by high quality, right? At every stage yeah. of the pipeline, right? And so, yeah. you know, are we going to count solely or, mo or rate most highly, you know, articles and highly ranked journals? Or do we want to, you know, recognize as high quality, as innovative, as important as a real contribution work that is more public scholarship, that is more collaborative, yeah. that is messier in certain ways, but recognize that as a different kind of knowledge production uh, that also is really valuable. And so, you know, that may mean changing tenure criteria or creating new kinds of faculty lines, right? You know, expanding the idea of clinical faculty beyond professional schools into certain kinds of disciplinary departments. I mean, what would it mean, say, for history departments to have clinical faculty who mm -hmm. were from uh, who were engaged in certain forms of public history, right? Who uh, might actually be working in libraries, archives, museums, youth programs, uh, right? You know, the National yeah. Park Service, right? Like, I mean, that could be really exciting to think about what uh, a clinical faculty would mean uh, in some of these areas. So I think, yeah. you know, there are ways in which in, um, in, you know, all sorts of ways we could advance these things. I just think we should try a bunch of them rather than my proposing one or two. Yeah, I, I, I love that. I mean, so so this idea that we might, in some ways, this kind of uh, relates to and returns us to some of your early comments uh, about sort of recognizing the ways in which uh, institutions of this sort, uh, you know, have historically supported certain uh, uh, populations of students, and perhaps uh, we might expand that, you said earlier, to supporting other populations of students. And I now hear you to be saying, uh, similarly, you know, perhaps uh, historically, we've sort of uh, supported certain types of engagement, but we might now expand expand the scope, right? Expand uh, our, our vision uh, uh, in quite literal ways uh, in terms of uh, recognizing that uh, we have the capacity to support uh, uh, a broader uh, diversity of uh, projects that are going to be quite innovative in uh, the ways that I, I hear you to be uh, gesturing towards. Um, given the amount of time that we have remaining, I'm going to uh, make a very hard uh, switch to some of the questions that are uh, hey. here in the queue. And I've, I've incorporated some of them into the uh, previous questions that I've uh, uh, put before you. But um, at this uh, moment, uh, I want to uh, uh, pick up on a question that's been posed here um, that I alluded to a little bit earlier, but uh, I think that uh, I, can, I can ask more, more directly. Uh, someone has asked here, you know, sometimes it seems as though diversity and inclusion are mentioned uh, in the same breath. Uh, you know, they're sort of talked about as though they uh, sit side by side. Um, are, are they ever in tension? Uh, and if so, how ought we think about the, uh, um, uh, navigating or negotiating uh, a tension between diversity on the one hand 
and innovation on the other. Do you have any thoughts about about that? Oh, okay. So it's diversity and innovation, not diversity and inclusion. You had initially said inclusion. So, so the oh, tension sorry, is. Uh, sorry, this person has said uh, diversity and innovation. My apologies. Yeah. Okay, great, great. Okay, just making sure I'm answering the right question. Of um, course. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, I think. Um, so, so I, th I think there are a few ways in which certainly they can be in tension with one another. One is that um, there's always this tension uh, between trying to sort of solve or innovate around a really big thing, a really big problem mm -hmm. that uh, manifests in lots of different ways for lots of different people. Uh, and trying to tackle a much narrower and more crisply defined problem um, that uh, we can then sort of more wrap our <laughs> heads around, right? And where there may be a specific uh, targeted way to solve it, right? And, you know, so oftentimes um, this is, uh, we, you know, when you have a particular group uh, or you know, right, making a certain kind of claim, mm. then when other people kind of generalize that claim, right? And say, oh yes, well, we should care about this for everybody. Then the first sure. group's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like by, we you know, trying by to trying to address a specific, yeah. Exactly, right. By expanding what you are doing is actually sort of denaturing the, yeah. you know, the, the claim and the problem, right? And so in that respect, um, you know, I think there is this tension sometimes, right? And so yeah. Uh, where we might, in fact, want to innovate around a narrower problem uh, first, mm -hmm. and hence attend to a less diverse, you know, group of claimants or something. The other way I think in which they can be intention, um, or at least felt to be intention, mm -hmm. is that uh, you know when you are a less diverse group it often just feels much easier, right? Like, you know, there are uh, shared cultural norms. You sort of, you think right. you, that you understand what you mean about things. People don't ask questions uh, or raise objections that are unexpected, right? That see, feel to you as if they're going to derail things, et cetera, right? Sure. Like, <laughs> and so you feel as if you're, potentially as if you're being much more innovative because things are like chugging along really smoothly, right? Now- sure. I think there's a pretty good body of empirical literature now that shows that actually the kind of the stickiness and the and and the hardness of working yeah. in a diverse group if it if you work well together actually really does serve innovation and you're going to actually create more innovative solutions to harder problems than if you were working in a more homogeneous group. But it certainly doesn't feel that way uh, to groups for a while. Uh, and yeah. so in that way, it can definitely feel as if those are intention, even if empirically uh, it's not true. Although it is true if your diverse group just doesn't work well together, right? Like the, sure. this gets us back to the inclusion piece. Right, merely being diverse is not enough to ensure ensure success. You actually yeah. have to then um, capitalize on the diversity and really make sure that you have equitable voice that you that people are you know actually taking the time to try to understand each other more deeply. You know things like that. Yeah, I mean, in, and again, in your early answer uh, to one of the first sort of prompts that I uh, put forward, you said something about exactly this. You said, you know, uh, uh, universities should think about, um, uh, you know, diversifying, uh, you know, the persons who are, who are on campus and making sure that those persons feel welcomed, right, and have the resources necessary to succeed. And so uh, hearing you sort of underscore that again, I think, uh, uh, brings us right back around. I'm going to now do a thing that I ought not do because we only have two minutes remaining, but the question here is just too good to pass up. Um, so I'm going to ask that you be somewhat brief if you, if, if okay. possible, but there's a question here about uh, uh, that's inviting you to say something about the value of formal ethical education, right? And uh, education in uh, uh, the practices of, uh, uh, of doing uh, and thinking about ethical matters. Um, and what what value that holds for um, uh, for citizenship, given the range of ways in which people show up in civic spaces? Any thoughts there? Yeah. So here I'll say I think that 
formal ethical education might be useful, but I do think that we should do it in a different um, uh, way than we often do. So what we usually do when we engage in formal ethics is that we say, teach people Kant, teach people John Stuart Mill or whatever. Like we, sure. we teach big ethical theories and then we teach people how to apply those ethical theories to concrete problems. And uh, as you know, in my own work, what we try to do is flip that and start yeah. with the concrete problems uh, because we're all uh, engaged in those and committed to those and they clearly matter. And then uh, out of our discussion of those problems, try to identify identify, okay, so what are the different values that are motivating us here? Or are we all embracing the same value, but we're interpreting it in different ways? And to start to develop a, a sort of an ethical vocabulary that may be shared and may get abstracted up, but out of the problems that uh, sort of unite us as something that we are caring about and we agree we need to fix. So it can still be a formal ethical um, training, but starting from the ground up as opposed to going from the top down. That's a wonderful note for us to end on. Uh, allow me to thank you, uh, Mira Levinson, for joining us in this uh, Shared Values Initiative community conversation. You've given us so much to think about. And on behalf of uh, the Buckeye Nation, I thank you uh, for your time and your efforts today. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Professor Thompson. Yeah. <laughs>